Good morning, everyone. I am Claudia Pergola. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at the New Jersey Elder Law Center at Goldberg Law Group and the author of two books, The Law Firm Revolution and my latest book, Life Lessons and Legacy, How Caring for My Grandmother Has Changed My World. I am here with Kim Luthi, Director of Wealth Planning with Synthesis Wealth Planning, and Roseanne de Torres, who is the managing partner of de Torres and the George Family Law. Welcome, ladies. Hello. Uh, so ladies, we are going to be discussing in this panel that uh, we hear a lot about the challenges that executive women face trying to juggle all the demands that are placed on us. Uh, we will go into self-care and setting boundaries and setting priorities and how important all these things are. We will tell you how we worked together as the panel to grow our businesses and setting up metrics. I know Roseanne is obsessed with her metrics. She's excited to tell you about how to use it to measure growth. We will talk about the importance of delegating and knowing your worth. I know a topic Kim loves. And you will learn all about the ways to plan to make sure that your lifestyle isn't affected from the unexpected things that may come up, which is one of my favorites. You're going to learn the ABCs of accumulating wealth. And if you are disciplined, we will look into cash flow planning and how important it is to pay yourself, but not to spend recklessly. I know my husband would agree. So uh, there's a lot to unpack here. So I, I want to get started with self-care for each of us. I know that's something different. Kim, I have always heard you stress that you are your most, most important important asset and you are a strong proponent of having a vision for your future. And so how do you strengthen your most important asset and use vision to bring the success you've achieved? Thanks, Clelia. Um, you are correct. Um, I, the most important asset people would think as a financial advisor would be something financially related, but I'm going to tell you that it's you. You are your most important asset. And again, I, I know it sounds strange coming from an, from an advisor, but one of the things that we can do to strengthen that most important, important asset is self-care. I know we've heard a lot about this, particularly in the last couple of years, for sure. Uh, we're here we are on a virtual event as well. We're constantly working. Um, I mean, the reason why we brought this conference to you is because we've been where you are and we know how difficult it is to set ourselves as a priority. Uh, you know, we, we're doing the same things that you are. We're trying to juggle family and work and friends. We're taking care of parents and kids. Uh, I've been through the ebbs and flows. I'm sure you have. Sometimes I'm really good at it. And sometimes I'm, I'm just back, back at the drawing board trying to make myself a priority. So I understand that it's not easy, right? Let's just all agree. It's really not easy. So trying, uh, you know, we're so busy trying to take care of everybody. If we don't time block time for ourselves. Again, we've heard that, and it's easier said than, do, uh, than done. Uh, and we don't give ourselves these boundaries to get rest. The problem is we don't have enough white space, right? <laughs> we're always looking at a screen. We're on our phones. Uh, we're talking with people. We truly need to recharge on a cellular level. We really need quiet, rest, peace. Uh, we need time to reflect. I mean, time away from the screen, of course, not after this conference, not today, but time away from the screen. Uh, we wanna, we, you know, sleeping. I mean, how many of us uh, go, oh, I'll get more sleep later. I'll just gonna keep go, go, go. We need to slow down and get the proper rest. Uh, if, if for you, maybe it means journaling, uh, getting that restorative time is really important. Hydrating is also truly important. And, and if you need to set a goal to how much you need to do, uh, you know, I get out my calendar and I look and it's kind of like the old days when we had kids or when you, what, you do a little star chart. And every day that you accomplish that goal, you give yourself a star. And then if you get enough stars, you don't want to stop getting stars. So try and, you know, create a goal and, and take care of yourself because truly you deserve it. I mean, you are the one that's keeping all those balls up in the air. And if you're not taking care of yourself, it can all crumble quite quickly. So we're here to talk about self-care and growth. And, you know, let me say something. We go to so many meetings, right? We're either preparing for a meeting, we're at a meeting, we're, you know, getting ready to go to a meeting. How about a me-t? 
ting. It's all about me. It starts at home, right? Um, but in order to do that, you have to have a clear vision. So what does that look like? That means time for introspection, uh, time to contemplate bigger decisions. You want to decide who you're going to be on this journey with, right, Clelia, Roseanne? And, uh, you know, what are they bringing to the table? Uh, we need time to kind of reflect upon that. So this is where you get your vision. Now, for those of you who have never created a vision board, that is a tool, right? And it's a way to kind of document what it is that you want your future to look like. Guess what? I've been doing these for years. Uh, once I created my own vision board, it was amazing how many things started to happen, right? Oh, Clelia is holding up her vision board. I have one as well. In fact, I have about 15 of them that I just brought downstairs. Uh, you know, putting those intentions out into the universe is what enables you to attract what you desire. And again, back to what you deserve. So, you know, I think when you have a vision that's, and by the way, it's going to be unique to you. It's limitless. You can accomplish anything you want. Kim, you make, you do, you make such a good point about it being about you and you being your most important ass, asset, making yourself a priority and having uh, a vision for your future. I know for my vision board, I also make it my background wallpaper. So yes. I see it everywhere. I can't possibly avoid it. So Roseanne, as an attorney, I know you have a rigorous schedule to say the least. So how do you manage to make yourself a priority? Because I know if you can, anybody can. It's true. As an attorney, my time is not my own. And uh, I think my paralegal admin spends uh, probably 40% of her time rearranging my calendar because uh, I'm a litigation attorney. So you never know what, what you're going to find on your desk when you walk in the door. Or, you know, it could be four o'clock in the afternoon, you're getting ready to go and something happens and you you whatever plan you had for self care that day gets derailed. But I have struggled with that. And um, Kim made some really great points about uh, I love what she said about habit tracking. I love those check marks, too. I do that. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm I absorb things like a sponge. I'm a lifelong learner. And uh, I always feel like uh, working on myself is something that I take a lot of joy and pride in. And uh, I never feel like I'm fully, I fully arrived at figuring out uh, how to care for myself. But a couple of things like just practical tips that I think work very well for me, even as uh, somebody, you know, as a litigation attorney that doesn't always have uh, their own time or has difficulty clawing time back, is I take the time that I have and I use it to my advantage. And a couple of ways I do that is, uh, first of all, I set very clear boundaries with my team about when they can put things on my calendar. Now, if the court says, Roseanne, show up tomorrow at two, I'm showing up at two regardless of what's on my calendar. So, but otherwise, if it's not a court event, I do block time heavily on my calendar. In fact, I block the entire morning until noon because if I didn't do that, my team would, I wouldn't have any time to think. Like you talk about white space. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have any time to think. I wouldn't have any time to work on the files or the cases for the clients that I have because they would just keep putting me in a meeting and a meeting. I mean, they used to do that to me. I said to them, hey, how about 15 minutes in between the meetings so I can go to the bathroom? <laughs> no, really, it comes down to that. But a couple of things I do, even before I leave the house, the night before, I want to eliminate as many decisions that are bad for me as I can. So what does that mean? For me, that means setting myself up for success. And it's as simple as putting my workout clothes out. Now, they're only five feet from where they're in, meaning like my dresser's over there five feet away, but I actually take them out of the dresser and I put them on a table in my closet so that I'm already set up. I know when I get up, the first thing I'm going to do is get my workout gear on and I'm going to work out for 30 minutes. Now, I don't work out like crazy. I don't do hours and hours in the gym. But if I, my promise to myself is 30 minutes, six days a week without fail. And it's not about commitment. It's about consistency for me. I do the same thing with whatever I think I'm going to be wearing the next day too. And that's kind of gone by the wayside because of COVID. That doesn't matter. Like I have a, a nice blouse on, but you don't know what I have under, underneath the blouse. But, it, but, but still, I do it, even if it's just I'm wearing jeans. 
Because again, it's one decision. I don't have to make the next morning. I'm on autopilot. The other thing that I do that really helps me, keeps me focused and uh, without the pendulum swinging emotionally throughout the day from side to side is I meditate. And I meditate every day uh, before I leave the house. And a lot of times I do it again at night. Um, and I do, I use a technique called transcendental meditation, which is very easy. And it's for, even for people that say they can't meditate because they can't empty their minds or they can't stop thinking. And, um, and I'm that person too, the busy mind, my chatter in my head never goes away, but this actually does work. And it's for those people who claim they can't meditate. And I'm one of those people, but what it does is it's actual brain rest. It's actually, uh, getting your brain waves to slow down and it's, it's scientific that it works so that throughout the course of your day, you're responding to your experience in a much different way, in a much calmer, more deliberate, authentic, and, and thoughtful way than when I don't meditate. If I can do that in the morning, I set myself up for success. Nighttime, that's the hardest part of the day for me to to do any kind of self-care uh, because that's just my bio rhythm. I'm a morning person. Um, it, at eight o'clock at night, you'll find me in my bedroom getting ready for bed. Now, my, I don't have young kids at home, so those days are behind me. So I can do that. You know, I don't have to worry about put, you know, dealing with children. Um, my daughter is all grown and gone. And getting yeah. ready for, for her own wedding. Yes, I'm getting ready for a big wedding. <laughs> That's so you, made, you, you made great suggestions. And in, in my life, what I do to maintain my self-care is actually very much like you, Roseanne. So I wake up in the morning and I already have my clothes picked out for the day, including my, my work, my workout clothes. And I vow to get my kids up at a certain time. I actually get them up 15 minutes earlier because I don't want to yell at them in the morning. So starting your day, especially a young mom with the children is always sets the tone for the day. And I remember if I yelled and I was running all over the place and had to make a meeting, I my the rest of the day, I just wouldn't feel good about myself. So I have vowed to not yell at them because the yelling does absolutely nothing. Um, I get them off to school and I am constantly, I'm a big proponent of mental health. So uh, I had suffered with anxiety. I guess I, once you suffer, I guess you will always suffer. Uh, and some practices that I learned is actually I was doing it while Kim and Roseanne were talking, you didn't even know. So if you are sitting there talking to somebody and if you just rub your fingers together and breathe and feel the fingerprints, you have to feel your fingerprints because that means that you're focusing intently on you and yourself. It's important that I'm constantly checking in with my body. Mm -hmm. um, when I went from one thing to another, from meeting to phone call, all of, I realized by the end of the day, I had never checked in with myself. And once I started to check in with myself, I realized that I actually didn't even breathe throughout the day. I would just breathe to survive, but not actually enjoy like my breathing. So that was very important. So on my way to work, I no longer talk to people. I will listen to a podcast that has to do with some sort of self-care, uh, whether it be my mind, body, soul, whatever. And then on my way home, and it has to be an emergency, but I will not speak to anybody on the way home because again, you're going from a meeting or meetings all day long, phone calls, emails, text messages, social media, and everybody is just perfect on all of these different communications. <laughs> and then I'm gonna go on my phone call and then I'm gonna go see my kids that are probably going to start fighting. So I need that time of silence. And Roseanne, I'm in my bed at nine o'clock with my children. Yes, my children are still in my bed at eight and six. But sometimes 
you know, I do it for me and I don't do it for them. And if they're That's in my bed right. at 26 years old, then boy, I, I really failed. <laughs> I but I don't, that. I don't think there's going to be a, you know, an 18 year old in my bed. So I think no, I'm, I'm pretty no. safe. So, um, so let's talk about boundaries and, and priorities. I just, I just mentioned a few. So Roseanne, can you talk about how setting boundaries has helped you? I know that you block time in your day to make sure yep. that you can work on business work or, or personal goals, or even mentoring, I know is big to you and mentoring your team. So can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, definitely. I mentioned uh, blocking, time blocking, I uh, block out nine to 12 every day, Monday through Friday. Uh, that is uh, what I put on my calendar is called deep work. That means that nobody's to put anything in there. That's when I work on my business. I work on client cases. I talk to cl clients. I may record a, a webinar, write a blog, uh, work on some marketing or anything related to the business. I do that. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is uh, one of the ways that we met this little tribe here and the gals that are putting on this collaboration conference is uh, we all attended uh, a conference together in Austin, Texas. If, I think it's going on four years now, mm -hmm. it's more than four years ago, uh, called The One Thing. And The One Thing is a book written by Gary Keller, a uh, real estate mogul, probably heard of him. And I really took to heart the premise of the book, which is when you do your goal setting and you figure out what it is you want your someday to look like, whether it's five or 10 years down the road, there's a way for us women to unpack that so that we know what to do today to get to someday. And it takes discipline. And like Kim said before, you know, some days you were better at it than others. Some days get just derailed. Like you have a, a, an idea what you're, what you're going to do today and then something happens and that's okay. But I always go back to what I call the big three. With, with the one thing, the book, the one thing, and the conference calls of the big three, what am I going to do today? The three things that can advance my someday goals. And I'm not talking about the three things I have to do for a client, although I do work on client matters a lot. I'm talking about the three things I have to do to advance my someday goals. And that usually relates to my business or personal life. It could be uh, modifying a webinar, it could be um, setting up a uh, Kim, you'll like this auto pay, auto paying myself, putting money in a, you know, in a savings account, invest, you know, just setting up uh, auto pays to myself. So something like that, it could be, uh, but basically three things a day that I like to do uh, to advance my someday, someday goals. And, um, and that, you know, that's pretty much uh, how I do it. And then everything that doesn't fit within those three things is I say no to, you know, I, I, it's kind of like uh, hell yeah. It's easy. It's got to be either hell yeah, I'm doing that, or it's a no. And and that and that goes for even networking or anything that I would do uh, with my time. Um, you know, once you get to a certain level, and I'm blessed to be at that level, you have to be judicious and very careful about how you spend your time because this, this time is the best, is the biggest, is the most valuable commodity we have besides right. ourselves. And uh, I can't say yes to everybody, although I'd like to. So saying no becomes very important um, to be careful about what you say yes to and say no to everything else. So Oprah actually in her podcast will start off each podcast with saying, I want you to take time, time for yourself. And her voice is so therapeutic to me at least. But Kim, I know you were uber excited when she said pay yourself. I know you're a big believer in, in paying yourself first. So why, why yeah. don't you tell everybody about this? I will. And I was chomping at the bit because um, I think everything Roseanne just said and, and Claudia, what you've been sharing is true. And listen, the name of this um, you know, section in our uh, conference is called From Frazzled to Focused, right? And uh, so we're, we're all being vulnerable here telling you about when we have been frazzled and when we've been focused. And there is an exponential difference when you're in one state or the other, right? And, you know, it's really important to pay yourself first. I love what Roseanne said by automating it. So typically what people do, or at least what we were taught to do is, you know, we would pay our bills, we'd spend some money and try and save what's left. And uh, you know what, that doesn't always work because we're once again, last on our list uh, by creating the wealth that you know, we need and deserve, by the way, to live 
a long, long life because Roseanne was talking about her someday goals. Well, my someday goal might be, listen, in, in 10 years from now, I want to be in the position where I can host my kids or grandkids. I let the kids go on a trip. Um, you know, in order to do that, I have to have the resources to do that. Oh, and I need to be healthy to do that as well. So, you know, your someday goals and, and creating and paying yourself first needs to be at the top of the priority list. Uh, we are so busy with distractions, social engagements, work projects, family time. Oh, and what happened to, again, that me time? And the me time is paying yourself first. Um, you know, typically when you're planning for retirement, think about it when we were younger, it seems so far away. And now it's like on the horizon for many of us. And we're like, oh my goodness, am I prepared? All I can say is that you can only start with where you are now and build on that going forward. You know, we can't worry about the past. We can only, you know, control on what's going on here in the present and plan for the future. So uh, making yourself that priority, we're back to that again, will give you that financial independence. Um, and truthfully, you want to be a blessing to people in, in, in this world, in your life, and not a burden. So paying yourself first is really a gift of love to everyone in your life. Uh, mm -hmm. And so creating those resources uh, is what's going to give you and your family options to, you know, to, to be part of that life, to care for you, uh, to be in, in your life and not feel like, you know, they're, they're there because they have to be. It's because they want to be. So true, Kim. I, from an estate and elder law perspective, our firm, we see so many families that just don't save and the burden that's put on the children is just so sad and they will figure it out they always do but to what cost you know so uh you know boundaries for me is not taking any meetings at nighttime i know mm -hmm. that young i i i was that person and i started the firm at 26 years old and I was out every night, you know, trying to grow the firm and, and represent to the best that I possibly can. But I realized, you know, eight years later that I really, I could have been home. And now I deny the opportunity to go to some amazing events at nighttime because I, I need to be there with, with my family. So uh, Kim, setting boundaries are, they're, they're often about looking to the future. And all the these ideas uh, are they're all intertwined. But what do you mean when you counsel people to protect their lifestyle from the unexpected? And I know that you've had some unexpected hardships in your life. So how have you dealt with it? Well, first of all, let me say I'm grateful for everything that's happened for me, not to me. Right. Because the unexpected gives us an opportunity to grow. Like Roseanne said, you know, it's in our fabric, Clelia, you as well. Growth is in our fabric. So uh, the unexpected, really, I say plan for it as if it's expected. Right. Because things do will happen. Things that we can't control. Only thing we can do is prepare for that. And it will kind of separate the girls from the women later down the road. Right. You're going to if you have uh, in your plan. Uh, the types of products and services, uh, let's say become sick or disabled. I mean, you're your most important asset, right? Didn't I say that in the first part of it? Your ability to make an income and keep all these balls up in the air. If you become sick or disabled, what's going to happen? So you want to uh, plan for uh, protecting your lifestyle by protecting your income. And you're right. Uh, I've had my whole and my fair share of uh, things, as many of you have. Um, and it actually has helped me become the woman that I am and the woman that I can't wait to keep growing towards. Uh, when I was 14, my parents got divorced. Not unusual to many people. Uh, but my mom was very ill and my dad was pretty absentee. So very quickly, I learned how to become independent. Uh, we, I was, I'm one of five and the top three of us were going to, going to work, trying to put some money into the oil tank to keep, keep, uh, keep the house warm for my younger brother and sister. Um, this is all okay because uh, it's just part of our story. Um, so we've learned a lot of lessons on how to be self-sufficient, how to be independent. Um, when I was 22, I've been doing this now 33 years. I may have been giving away my age. Maybe I've been doing it 34 years. Anyway, when I was 22, I sold myself of disability policy. And when I, uh, I think it was about 14 years later, I delivered my son, who's now 19, and there were complications, and I was on disability claim for two and a half years. So I make a joke to my then husband saying, good thing I was thinking about these things 
uh, when you were playing softball with your buddies, because this source of income that came into that house enabled us to continue to pay the mortgage and save for college and maintain our credit and all of those things that people don't necessarily think about. You know, um, I think most people believe in these type of things. They just often don't want to pay for them. So I can tell you how important it is. It was in those 14 years of premium payments that I came back, I was paid back about 10 times that in benefit. And when you pay for your own policy, all the pre, all the benefit you get back is income tax free. So I have to say in my entire life, it's probably the only two years I didn't have to pay income tax. Um, so think of that one. Uh, so, you know, the thing is you just have to, um, Think about if you live too long, what does that look like? You become sick or disabled. And clearly you work for an elder law care group. You know the importance of long-term care planning. Uh, one other quick story, my father, who was uh, one of my first clients, I would say, uh, some of the things he took advice on, other things he thought he could self-insure. My dad was diagnosed at 65 with early onset Alzheimer's. And uh, we spent down his estate to the tune of $17,000 a month. So good news, bad news, my dad's been passed now for eight years, but um, you know he died before he ran out of money. So I think it's truly important really just to prepare and, and think about what your cash flow is gonna look like. And oh, by the way, let's stress test all this. Let's put in some what if scenarios. What if I wanna retire at 60? What if I become sick? What if I have to take in a, a family member and take time away from earning and contributing to accounts because that's what women do, right? We're the primary caregivers. So, you know, I think just protecting yourself, that's your foundation. You really owe it to, to yourself to do that. Um, Cause we spend more time planning a vacation often than we do planning for our financial future. Uh, so I don't know, you know, Kelly, it's really about uh, just protecting your lifestyle. Absolutely. I know metrics plays a big role in everything that we do. My business partner actually told me when we first started, save until it hurts. And every time, you know, I grew financially or my husband grew financially, we saved more. And now sometimes I have arguments with him, like, why do we have so much invested? <laughs> but uh, I will be thankful in the end because I know my kids will not be burdened with uh the long-term care costs because unfortunately it's just it's what it is nobody dies in their sleep then sleep anymore so i know uh metrics figure into the equation for all us in terms of of how we plan and for how we measure growth for while well, for me i use metrics personally and professionally as far as the business i know my business partner the certified elder law attorney uses metrics as far as planning so are you going to have enough money to take care of yourself? If you're a married couple, that is the biggest problem because if the husband becomes disabled or has some sort of diagnosis of dementia, Parkinson's, cancer, you're going to be spending a lot of money on his care. And are you going to have enough money to take care of yourself as his wife and have options as you age? And that's, and that's all it is, right? It's always more money just gives you options. Mm -hmm. oh, That's yeah. it. So yeah. Roseanne, um, I know that this is your, like your sweet spot. You're like, okay, mm -hmm. why is anybody else talking about this right now? This is like my thing. Okay. How has knowing your metrics helped you with planning for growth and anticipating needs changes, uh, need changes within your organization or meeting your goals? It's, it's really everything. And it's funny people think about me that way that I'm like the metrics guru, but I, you know, they, that whole thing came about the, my focus on metrics came about because I had a mentor who asked me questions I couldn't answer. Where did I get my clients from? Were they more men or women? How much money did our, my typical client make? When I went about the task of defining my ideal client, I didn't know who my ideal client was because I didn't know who my clients were. I had no demographic data on them. I didn't know the source of the client. Where were they coming from? Or is it word of mouth? Are they, is it, you know, I'm not gonna, I won't say yellow page ad, but believe me, I'm old enough to know, we, you know, I had a yellow page ad once when I first. So started. did I. <laughs> I think, did they make phone books anymore? Yes. Anyway. They and they still do, I, by the way. 
Yeah. So we began the process over time. And my firm now is 11 years old. Um, over time, it took us a, quite a while, but we did it, which was to integrate our marketing and our CRM so that we know when people come to us, whether even if they come by word of mouth, if Kim sends me a client and does an email introduction, that person goes into our CRM and we continue to market to them. And I know I can, with a click of a button now, you know, we used to do this manually. I know with a click of a button, how many cases Kim referred to me or how many cases the Goldberg Law Group referred to me. And I know what the value, the dollar value of those clients was, you know, were to me with the firm. Etc. I know uh, the demographic data on those that client, the age, the gender, how many kids did they have, what's their, where did they live, and so what gets measured gets done. To you know, that's basically the bottom line. And, and every industry, every business is going to have different metrics. I like what you said, Chloe, about you have personal metrics and 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 business metrics, and and I do too. But uh, from a professional standpoint, the the metrics drive everything that we do in the firm. And then there are individual metrics that we use to measure productivity with the individual attorneys. We have five attorneys in the firm and five paralegals, and they all have benchmarks that, you know, they have to meet because otherwise we, we don't make any money. I, I, you know, I like to say to them, you know, it would be nice if I I could just uh, be so generous just to have a spot for you to drive up to this building every day and come into this building and have a nice office to sit at. I said, but we're all here to make money. So you've got to make a profit for us. Like that's just the way it is. And uh, in our work, it's, you know, it's ours build and and collected. Um, So we, you know, we typically have like a one third, one third, one third uh, uh, split. We like to see a third go to the, uh, employee, a third go to profit and a third go to overhead. So, but it doesn't always work out like that. And, you know, certainly uh, when we have different uh, scenarios where they're not that product as productive as that, then, uh, you know, if, if they're a great cult- cultural fit, then we're keeping them, you know, because you can always train for skill and technique, but you cannot, you know, typically it's very hard to find people that fit you personality wise. So anyway. That's so true, Rosanna. I mean, one of my goals last year in my business plan were were to make metric based decisions. And that was not, you know, I hung my hat on the fact that, you know, I've done, I'm a non attorney running a law firm, and I've gone with my gut. And there were there's a time and a place where you could go with your gut. And 11 years in, you know, it's probably time to rely on metrics. So I think for the business owners that we have on here or entrepreneurs looking to uh, create their own business or start their own business, they should track where their business is coming from. Track everything because Mm -hmm. knowledge is power. And if you are working for someone else, that doesn't mean that you don't have the power to not make that decision. I am not the partner here and I have made the decision because I have posed the issue to the partner that it is very important for us to uh, to track metrics and why. So I think it's important that you educate yourself and you and you um, state your case. So met- I know metrics is a huge topic and I know Kim, you you measure metrics, but I want to ask you a more important question because right now it's all about the car you're driving, the yacht you're on on the weekends, Wealth, 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 wealth. Everybody's, everybody's talking about it. I'm really upset right now. I'm not wearing my Louboutins, but you can't tell. So <laughs> no one's going to know. Um, but it's all about discipline, right? So tell us your experience with this and, and any tips that you, can ha- that you have to help us maintain some discipline in accumulating wealth. So first, before I do that, I just want to say, for me, my wealth is about the relationships that I have. So uh, I, I, I have very nice things. I have built a life. It's been really hard at times, but I feel really, really grateful. My uh, building wealth, however, as we said already, it pro- get, uh, provides us with choices. So discipline. I met a gentleman when I first got into this business and he posed a question uh, many, many years ago. He said, what is worse, the pain of discipline versus the pain of regret? And I have never forgotten that statement. 
uh, well, actually, I must have at times because I'm not always, you know, it's the ebbs and flows, right? We go from frazzled to focus. But I, uh, I you know, when we talk about metrics, by the way, I kind of try and track my behavior, you know, and my behavior might be reaching out to sending five thank you handwritten notes a week. I mean, isn't it nice when you get one of those? I love to receive those birthday cards. I used to get them. Now I get, you know, shout outs on Facebook. Uh, but, <laughs> right. But accumulating wealth uh, is really back to kind of paying yourself first. And it's important that um, we are what we're accumulating are uh, memories. And, and I want to have limitless energy around those that I'm with and being there, like Roseanne was talking about her someday goals. So retirement planning is really, uh, I, I, you know, I teach classes about retirement planning and I talk about the accumulation phase almost being the easiest part of it. We're, you guys have all both mentioned about systematically and discipline-wise paying yourself, right? That's part of your DNA. If, if all we do is do that and we just make it automated and we do that each and every month, guess what? When you do get to that horizon of retirement, you're going to see some wealth and you're going to have choices. It's in the distribution phase where you really have to watch it because one mistake could really change the trajectory of where you're going. Think about it, and I'm not a big sports analogy person, but I know uh, you ladies both play golf. Uh, what's the difference between the number one golfer and the number three golfer in the world? Just a How couple much? strokes, just a couple strokes, right? So, you know, in the distribution stage of planning, you have to watch uh, how you're accumulating your wealth, and then how you're distributing it. So I kind of would put a spotlight on on both of those activities, but know that when you're ready to get ready to distribute, you have to think about who's sitting, this is all about who's sitting at your table, right? Who's sitting at your table, who understands you, where you're going, where you've been, how you make decisions, because money is very uh, individualistic, right? Everybody has a different uh, approach to it, and they come to the table with a different mindset. So um you know, I, I hope that helps to answer some some concerns. I mean, you really want to work on being disciplined uh, to accumulate that so you have less regrets. Absolutely. And Roseanne, so when we spoke, when we speak about discipline, you talk about discipline in a different sort of context by, you know, delegating tasks. And I know that is extremely, I, I just want to, Hold on, reiterate that extremely difficult, especially for attorneys. But you yeah. are definitely a, a, you are definitely a model. So explain how delegation, it's a strategy, right? How it's worked for you in the past and how do you build confidence and how do you trust your team? You know, I everybody makes mistakes. I um, if somebody else can do it. You know, it's a lot. It's about letting go of control in a big, big way, and being a, a, a micromanager. Everybody executes differently. So I could give both you and Kim the same task and say, "This is the outcome I'm looking for," and you're going to approach it differently, and that's okay. If you want me to tell you how I would do it, or you want my advice about how I would do it, or uh, ideas about how to do it, I'm happy to tell. I'm happy to share that with you. But I let them decide how to execute. And really, um, over the years, it's been an amazing, freeing thing, because number one, I work on the things I want to work on. I'm not doing the tedious things I don't want to work on that I can delegate. And if somebody else can do the task, then that's what I delegate. If only I can do it, then I have to. Do, that's what I do. And so that, that it's easy to decipher what, what I should be working on and what, what others could be working on. But it's freeing because you I've built a... A, a scenario I go to every day that is uh, I'm doing exactly what I want every day. I mean, how blessed can that, you know, I couldn't be more blessed. Every day I go to a place I get to do exactly what I want to do for the most part. I mean, sometimes, you know, my adversaries uh, embroil me in disputes I don't want to be in, but uh, for my client's sake, but, you know, for the most part, I'm, I, my time is, uh, is uh, really free to do what I want within reason. And I uh, couldn't ask for more. So delegating, yes, you, you know, that's a skill you've got to learn. Yeah. And, and it's hard. And it's, I think it's hard for all three of us to even do that. Right. Cause we're type, type A personality. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, it's hard. It, delegating though is, is the franchise model, right? You have yep. to think about 
multiplying this over and over again. And in any business or anything that you do, if you can multiply it over and over again, it makes it that much easier not thinking about it. So for me, I know discipline, uh, again, I said, not taking meetings at nighttime, not speaking to anybody on the way home. I have uh, our mission, vision, values. If you don't have one, please look into it is one of the most important things that a company can have. I know they're smiling. They have one. It's the reason of why you're doing it. What's your vision for the future? And what are the values that you stand for? My entire team, if they aren't compassionate and proactive and team oriented, if they don't align with our values, they no longer work here. It's very important. And Discipline, I know for me, is my grandfather always said he had a third grade, third grade education, and he said, don't ruin my name. And he was like he was a king and very well known. And Domenico Barone was not a king. But if he found out that I ruined the reputation of the Barone family, it was a problem. So he always said, when you say something, when you say you're going to do it, you do it. So, and that is a big proponent of who we are at Goldberg Law Group. When we say that we're going to do something, no matter who it is, we have the vow that we're going to do it. So um, there, there's so many things and we can have this conversation go on and on, but ladies, the, the advice that you gave, I think was absolutely phenomenal. I know that you're both on social media. We have your contact information on all over Collaborate. So if anybody wants to reach out, feel free, but I do want to leave everybody with this, is that social media is only what you want people to see. So sometimes you have to get off of social media to think clearly and think of what you want. From frazzle to focus, social media frazzles you. I know when I spend too much time of it, my values become questionable, right? I start to desire things that I don't really want. So uh, I think that, that that is important. And for some of you, it's taking the phone call at nighttime because you have other things that you're doing during the day. So whatever we said here, apply it to where you are in life. So thank you everybody for, for joining in and thank we hope you. you have a great rest thank of your you. day. Thanks thank ladies. You. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.